Good afternoon, good morning, where you, wherever you might be, uh, and welcome to Submarine Live. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a week joining the Nexon First Ascent mission and sharing with you the excitement and science of deep ocean exploration. Now, the team are on the Ocean Cephal vessel um, in the Seychelles archipelago near an island called Aldabra, and we'll be joining them very, very shortly. Submarine Live is part of AXA XL Oceans Education, and we are broadcasting from Sonodyne HQ, the wonderful team who make the underwater communications possible. Um, before we start, uh, some shout outs to the schools who are joining us. Uh, we have schools from UK, uh, the USA, and Bermuda. Welcome, one and all. Uh, a big hello to Brimsdown Primary School. Hi. Um, to Worksworth Junior School, hello. Um, to Windermere School, hello. Um, to Lindenhurst High School, big hello to you. Uh, and to 5B at Kendall Park Primary, wonderful to have you all joining us. Um, really, really exciting. I'm just going to see whether we can get um, Dr. Lucy Woodall on the line. Um, Nexon's chief scientist. Lucy, hello. Are, are you, you receiving? Me? I am, I can hear you. Yes, hello. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for sparing the time out of what I know must be a very, very busy schedule. Um, it's wonderful um, to have you with us. The, the, the Nexon first descent mission, I mean, can you briefly share with um, the schools watching what's it all about? Yes, yeah, so it's super exciting. We're here in Seychelles, which is a nation of lots of islands. Um, and we're on one of the most special right now. Aldabra, that you can just see behind me, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that means that it's incredibly special for the unique life that lives there. And you might have heard of giant tortoises in Galapagos, and they also live here in Aldabra. So what is the expedition? So we're interested in understanding all of the forms of life that live on the surface, all the way down to 500 meters. And this takes us from the light right up at the surface, through the twilight zone, and into the deep dark sea. So we're going to explore what we find across these depths, and if it's the same in each of the islands that we don't have the at. Uh, absolutely amazing. and and. How? What, what? What is your role, Lucy? Uh, apart from um, apparently your your nickname, Dame Lucy Woodall, because you're so important on the expedition. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that's uh, that's a great standing name. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm chief scientist. So that means that I essentially I'm responsible for organising all of the science activities. I'm planning our locations, where we're going to go. Uh, the most exciting part is I get to choose who goes in the submersibles that day. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, and then we come up to the, when the submersibles come up to the surface, when the nets come in, we all join in together and process the biology and enter all the data. Um, so I guess I'm really here just as a mentor to make sure everything's going okay and to point the expedition in the right direction. Not, 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 a, not a bad role. You, you mentioned submersibles there, and I, I know we've got some submersible questions coming up, but why, why submersibles? Why, why can't we just drop instruments in or, or dive in to find out about the deep ocean? Well, the ocean is very complex. And there's lots of different things that live there. From really, really tiny little zooplankton to massive big corals and whales and sharks. So we can't sample everything, we can't get a record of it using the same bit of equipment. We have to use lots of different pieces of equipment. And the submersibles are one way for us to do that. Um, the submersibles are brilliant. We might see one coming out behind us if we're really lucky because they're on a dive right now. So if you see a yellow thing popping up, then uh, give me a shout and I'll turn around and show you all. Um, they've got these big bubbles and as the team in the submersible, we sit in that bubble and we can look, see what's going on around us. Not only can we see ahead, we can see up, out to the sides, and also 
also underneath our feet. It gives us an opportunity of really seeing how the different animals um, are engaging with each other and also uh, what's going on out of the sides. Sometimes when you put cameras down, you just have one little view and then maybe out the corner of that camera, you see this little fin going past. Ah, I wish I was there. And this gives us the opportunity to experience and actually be there. It sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, just coming on to that, is that a dream job? And this is a question from 5B at Kendall Park Primary. Is, is how, how did you get your job? Hello, Kendall Park. Um, a bit warmer out here than it is with you, I'm sure. Um, so what did I do? Well, I studied for a long time. Um, but I think the most important thing was I, I wanted to ask questions. I was curious about the world around me. I was interested in the ocean. So that meant as a kid, I spent time in rock pools, um, looking at all the starfish under the rocks. Um, but for you guys, it might be something different. It might be walking in those amazing hills nearby your schools, um, walking out in the countryside, looking at birds maybe and not fish. Um, so I spent a long time studying, but I also wanted to ask questions. Um, and I think that it's a bit of persistence, keeping going, really trying hard, um, but being excited about what you do. Amazing. And, and was there anything that you had to study um, specifically to get your job or, or do you just have to spend a long time at university? Yes, yeah, so um, my first degree is in um, broad biology. So, you know, that was, that was pretty flexible. Um, I always loved the ocean and that was the thing that really drove me into getting some other skills. So I'm a scuba diver as well. Um, I know how to navigate ships, and that's another skill. Um, so then I spent another five years after doing my degree and three years doing my PhD studies, really then um, trying to specialize in what's out here in the ocean, looking what's here and investigating all of the really interesting um, creatures. And I mean, it, it, it sounds like uh, an amazing uh, job to have and, and you've, you've, you've obviously spent a long time sort of working at it. What inspired you in the first place to get into this field? Uh, curiosity. Um, my mom tells a great story that I was about four or five and I was in a rock pool and I held up a starfish. And said, mom, what's this? So you see it's a starfish. Have you seen that before? I'm like, yeah, okay. put it down, look up another rock picked up another starfish. I said, Mom, what's this? She says, you see, it's a starfish. I've just told you. And my response was, but it's a different color and shape. It can't be a starfish. So for me, I think looking back on it now, it's like, oh, I was really curious about why these things were called the same thing, but they looked different. They lived in a different place. What was under a rock? What wasn't under a rock? Why were they living in different places? Um, so for me, I think that's what I really love, curious about the ocean. I also kind of like the intrigue. You can see the surface up here now, the beautiful blue and the beaches behind. You can't really see what's under until you go and explore it. And it's kind of one of the only places left on our planet that we haven't really explored, that we don't understand. So it's pretty exciting that when we come out here, we can be the first humans ever to see a part of our planet. That is cool, that is amazing, and that's such a privilege. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds absolutely fantastic, and from, from the rock, rock pools to the, to the Seychelles. Um, Taylor um, has just sent in a question, and he, he would love to know, um, have you seen any glowing creatures? Obviously, we, we associate glowing uh, with the deep sea. So, that's right, and you, that's very astute of you, Taylor, because actually in the deep sea, things have evolved to have some light sometimes, and you sometimes see the big angler fish with their funky lures in front of their faces, with tiny little lights on, attracting prey. Um, however, um, where we're here um, in Seychelles, the light actually comes down quite a long way. So all the way from the surface, trickling down, the amount and the type of light changes. But even at 100 meters, we can see out without any lights. 
Um, so it, get, it means that we have to get really, really deep here before the light goes away. And that means that animals in this area, in the depths we're looking at, have not actually evolved those sorts of light mechanisms. Now, sometimes we see lights on the surface of the water. Um, this is bioluminescence. And these are little creatures that come out in the dark. And of course, it's nighttime, so we see the lights. Um, but we need to go quite a bit deeper, or we need to go to different parts of the world before we see those um, those creatures that have evolved to use light in the depths we work in. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, a question coming through um, looking at what um, interpersonal skills um, you need for this type of job. Obviously, you were at, I think you're at sea for seven weeks in total, and you're, you're halfway through at the moment. What kind of sort of uh, skills or attitudes do you need to, to take part in an expedition of this kind? Well, that's actually a brilliant question, because I think it's as much about of what you know on board as how you're going to get that work done. So those skills of teamwork, leadership, and being able to make decisions when it's a little bit stressed, being calm are really important. So what do you need? You probably need a sort of a problem-solving attitude. Um, you can't just nip down to the shops and buy something if something goes wrong. So everybody on board here has been working out how do we mend this for the zip tie? You know, how can we use some tape to fix this problem? Um, and everybody's helped each other. So being really helpful, working in as a team, and also taking responsibility for things. I can't look over everything all the time. There's so much that everybody's doing. So each of my team members are responsible for a little thing on board. Somebody for the nets, someone else for making sure the video is downloaded from the submersibles. So it's kind of both that teamwork and also the autonomy to say, I can do this, and really providing ownership of those skills and then we can all move on together and we can be really successful. So good combination. Also, a bit of humour always helps, especially if you're stuck on board with people for seven weeks, you know, having a bit of a laugh and helping each other out. Everybody's going to have a bit of a down day and a bit of day we're tired. But you know what, the rest of the team are bouncing, then that really helps. Brilliant. Really, really interesting to, to hear. Um, and a follow-up question for that. What, what What's the best thing about your job? Well, there are so many amazing things. I can't give you just one. So I'll just give you two because I, I know that time's on and I'm sure you've got loads more questions. So for me, part of it is sort of that internal, I get to go places um, and I'm incredibly privileged to come to some of these amazing parts of the world and be able to share that with others. Um, but the second part is that on board with us, we're here in Seychelles, so we have a number of Seychelles war scientists. And actually, it's an amazing privilege to be able to share the own waters of the Seychelles war um, with them. And they haven't been able to see these waters before. So all of the Seychelles war team get a submersible dive, really get to experience the waters. That's incredibly important because it's them that's going to drive the sustainable management and conservation of these waters and keeping them looking like this for generations to come. Brilliant. I mean, it's, it sounds like a, a huge privilege. I mean, we've got a number of questions um, coming in um, really about the, um, the different animals you may have seen and maybe some of your favourites. Um, Maisie would like to know um, what is your favourite type of fish in the sea? Well, Maisie, you've got me there because my favourite type of sea, uh, type of fish is a seahorse. I spent five years studying seahorses during my PhD studies. Um, so I like a seahorse. They're funny looking. Um, it's sometimes quite hard to see, but an amazing sight when you do see them. They're always very camouflaged. I mean, incredible. And, and just to, to, to remind that, that even even given its name, that a, a seahorse is in fact a fish. It's right, yeah. So it is a fish. It kind of looks like this. It swims along vertically. It's a little head out the front, and it's a little trunk of a body, and then a tail. It can swim, but generally they're pretty lazy. They like to hang out, hang 
hanging on to things. So they curl their tail around the corals, hang out in the breeze, that's the current underwater, and wait for their food to flow by and then snap. So that sounds, sounds like a, a pretty, pretty good life. Um, moving on to maybe slightly uh, bigger fish, um, Henry would like to know if you have found any new species of shark. Well, I wish, Henry. So at the moment, um, all I can tell you is that we know we've seen lots of different species. And this goes from, you know, the really iconic hammerheads with their eyes on each of the corners, um, some of the thresher sharks with those beautiful big long tails, but also interestingly, a shark called a six gill shark. Now, often if you're in your reef, you wouldn't see a six gill shark because they're actually deep water species. And we saw it probably at the shallowest, it probably ever goes to. So this is some really interesting information. We found it here in Aldabra. We've already fed that back to the team that managed the area here, because it could be that the waters here off Aldabra are really helping animals that are coming up from the deep. And that maybe wasn't so expected. So we've got lots more work to do to try and really understand all the different species we see. Um, that's quite a lot in a year or maybe a few months worth of work to figure out if we find anything new. But there's some exciting bits to start you off with. Amazing. I think we've just been able to show um, some footage of the thrusher shark um, with that amazing sort of long whip-like tail um, behind. Were you, were you in the submersible when, when that was filmed? No, sadly not. No, the team have seen all sorts of things. They've seen freshers, they've seen manta rays, they've even seen a sunfish, you know, that funky fish that should swim this way, but actually swims this way. Um, amazing, but I wasn't there. No, I was managing the team on board, but at least they got amazing videos so we could share that when they got back to the boat. Well, it's been really wonderful to, to see those coming through. Um, a couple more questions. We have uh, Tyler and Autumn who are interested, um, first of all, in clownfish. Do you get clownfish where you are? Is ne have you found Nemo? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, there are clownfish here. So not so much in the depths we're looking at because they hang out in the shallows in their little anemone homes. Um, but actually on a couple of our dives, we've seen those really big anemones that they live in and we have spotted a few Nemo's. Amazing, and, and you, you talk about sort of go, going deeper. So the, 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 the Nemo type coral reef and where you're exploring it and researching, are those two different parts of the ocean? Well, I wouldn't say two different parts. I always think of them like this big connected unit. So up at the surface, we have Nemo's Reef, lots of really bright colours, because there's lots of light up there, um, and that's where all the bright colours live. And they're those bright colours because lots of little tiny algae that live in there and light up the corals. But as we go down through into the twilight zone, um, those colours change a little bit. We get lots more sort of whites and browns. Um, and then as we go down deeper, then we lose some of those coral habitats as well. So we can really see the difference from the surface all the way down to 250 metres, which is the range of our submersibles. Uh, absolutely incredible and to, to, to have that range of marine habitat. Um, more about some of the animal life you, you may or may not have seen. This is about um, marine mammals, um, whether you've seen any marine mammals and, and the, the particular um, animal that uh, was we were looking at for this again from Tyler and Autumn was a, was a sea lion because I think that's very connected with the Galapagos. It is connected with Galapagos. Um, we haven't seen any sea lions here. We don't get them in this part of the ocean. Um, it's quite hard to see a lot of mammals. Sometimes we'll see whales and dolphins. Um, we haven't seen many on this expedition yet. Um, but what we have instead is a little sensor that we put into the water called a hydrophone um, and we'll be starting to deploy that over the next few days to see if we can pick up any of the sounds that some of these um, marine mammals are making. So um, we might not actually see them but we could be able to detect them. 
That's absolutely amazing. I, I, I heard a sort of like a klaxon going off behind you. Does that mean <laughs> we, we, we might have a little submarine recovery happening soon? Uh, yeah, that was the start of the crane. So, um, yeah, I think it probably is the moment coming up to the surface. But, um, yeah, you guys keep a watch and I will as well. And let me know if you see it in the background. Fantastic. And, and just looking behind you, um, one of the students has spotted a big N behind you. What does the N stand for? Oh, yes, down here. Oh, good spot. Um, so N stands for Necton. Um, Necton is the charity that has put together this expedition. Um, and the work we're doing out here is science-based, but of course, this um, event here, talking to everyone in schools, is a really important part of what Necton does, as is the training with the Seychelles War scientists and the work we do with the general media, trying to bring this to a larger audience. So we're here on behalf of the ocean, trying to get everyone as excited as we are about this amazing opportunity. Absolutely incredible. Um, I so we talked a little bit about um, sort of the depth of the submersibles down to sort of 250 meters. What, what, what's the deepest you've ever been, Lucy? I, I think two, two things. What's the deepest you have physically been? And then what's the deepest that you have studied, even if you haven't been directly there? Right, so they are two different things. Um, I have personally been to 300 meters, so a little deeper than the submersibles are going to go on this expedition. Um, and that was in Bermuda, so hey to Bermuda. Um, the deepest I've studied is, I think, 4,526 metres. We go very precise. Very yeah, precise. So, so I do remember, because there are uh, amazing hydrothermal vents. So they, these are fantastic chimneys with all of this hot gas that comes out. It's a very unique ecosystem in the deep sea and very special animals live on there. Incredible. And, and, and underwater chimneys at four and a half kilometers down and, and strange animals or, or, or just, just sort of like deep, deep sea fish? Oh, and a really different thing. So because these chimneys have hot um, gases and liquids coming out of them, essentially, you know, it's everything that's coming out from below our crust coming up into the water column. There's, it's very hot and it's got lots of quite different chemicals in them than the rest of the ocean surrounding it. Um, so there are special animals that have evolved to live on these vents. Um, and depending where you are in the world will depend on what type of animals live there. So the vents that I've seen have a few shrimp, but mostly loads and loads of this little sna like snail-like creature. We call it a, a scaly foot it's got these little carbon black almost like little shoes on the bottom of its um of its body i, I guess so it doesn't get burned right um so scaly foot gastropods is uh, is what we found but just like little snails that you find in your garden but with tiny little black almost like little tiles on the bottom bottoms of their feet amazing it sounds like completely completely otherworldly We've got some uh, questions from year five and six at Diddington. Um, they would like to know when was the first time you went down in a submarine um, and what was it like? Well, it was truly amazing. I'll ask, answer the first question, second question first. Um, really amazing. That was down in Bermuda um, two years ago now. Um, so for me, it was really special because we had a little fish that followed us around at the surface and I was looking out at the fish, looking in at me and then we slowly started to descend below the water. It was really special because the fish came down with us too and for me that was like the surface of the ocean was following me down and then we went down and down, we had our lights off and it got darker and darker then when we got to 300 meters, which is where we were going to survey, the lights came on and the whole, this amazing wall with brightly colored corals and a lot of fish on it just lit up out of the gloom. Um, 
really amazing. In front of me, there was the other submersible. Um, and looking up, I could still see the surface and all the little waves at the surface. Really magical. It, 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 sound, it sounds uh, re really amazing. And I mean, it, is, we've talked a lot about 300 meters and then using other methods to look further. Is it possible to get a submarine that can go deeper? And, and that's a question from, from Demi. But yes, so different types of um, submersibles, and I think the other one's coming up. We can see the boat in the background there. You see that red boat? Yeah. Um, that's that uh, us, uh, it helps the submersible when it comes up. So keep your eyes open for the submersible. Um, I'm going to stand to the side a little bit so you can see more of the water. Uh, so some submersibles um, have got those really tiny windows, and those can go a lot deeper. So you can get them down several more hundreds of meters. Um, but the ones we have have got the big dome on them so we can see loads. And because of that, um, the pressure of the water means that we can only go to about 250 meters. OK, so, so maybe maybe bo both those qualities can, can be <laughs> sort of joined together in, in future years. That would be really amazing. So now we've got the crane coming out, uh -huh. so that'll tell us that the is on the surface. And so, Lucy, will we will, what will we see as uh, the submersible comes to the surface? We're going to see the top of its little dome. So that's that's uh, see through, and then the sides of this submersible are yellow. So that's what we'll see. And once you see two people are sitting inside, so we have our pilot and our co-pilot. Amazing, and and you know, we, we hear a lot about yellow submarines. Can, can you have any colour, or, or is yellow the only one you're allowed? No, you're allowed to put a few different colours. Um, we have one on board here that's red as well. So we have our yellow submersible and our red submersible. Um, but uh, yeah, today we are looking at the yellow submarine. Fantastic. Um, and this is, there's a little bit about um, some the copious amounts of downtime and recreational time that you have on board an expedition. <laughs> uh, do you get to go for a swim off the side of, of the ship at the end of the day? Well, if only. No, unfortunately not. In fact, copious amounts of downtime, that's, uh, that's not quite how it is. So our first meeting in the morning is 6.45 before the sun comes up. And then we have a meeting at the end of the day at seven. Um, and after that, everyone tries to put in put their data. So we have very long days. Um, and the team probably watch a movie sometimes at the end of the day. But um, we're out here. We're in look we're about in two, three hundred meters of water at the moment. So it's really not safe for us to swim. Now we were able to swim the other day, which was really amazing because we went very close to the shore and we were doing some scientific calibrations of our cameras. We use a double camera system on board, which enables us to look at the um, animals in two different ways. So we look at them over here, we look at them over here. And those two different views allows us to accurately measure what we're looking at. But to do that, we need to calibrate our setup. Um, and that's what we were doing on the beach. So we use it as an example to do some swimming. Yeah, a, a very good place to do some scientific instrument calibration. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, uh, Ned, um, following on from that, two questions. One from Mrs. Spencer's class. Um, very interested, and a question comes through that whether you have ever swum with a whale shark. Obviously, some, some personal ambitions there or some dreams from the students there. My dream too. No, I haven't had that opportunity. And in fact, I haven't yet seen one for uh, real. So I too have been watching the TV and seen them on TV shows, but never yet swung with them. So it's on my list and fingers crossed one day. And and then um, we, ha we have another class, not, not wishing you um, so much as, as looking forward to those sort of wonderful experiences underwater. But what has been the most dangerous creature you have been in the water with? Dangerous creature? Well, that is a difficult question. 
because really most of the animals we see are either curious, so we had a few fish come in and look at us, um, but they just uh, make them confused because we look like a very strange fish to them. And things that you might think of that are dangerous, things like sharks, they might be curious, have a little look from the outside, so you'll see them just sort of over here, and then they'll swim off because they know that you're not food or you're not someone that they need to worry about. Um, here we go. You guys see that? I'm just going to move you around here because the submersible is just coming to the surface. As in, as, what a great view. I don't, how, how long has the team been down in the water for? See that? Can you see that yet? Yep. Yeah, to turn it a bit more. You got it? Yes. You see the submersible? Yes. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Fantastic. All right. So over here. Um, sorry, what was that question again? I was getting too excited I, about the submersible. No, I was just, just wondering sort of how, how long um, has the uh, submersible been underwater for? How long have they been down there? Is it so hours, days, minutes? <laughs> so we do our dives normally between about two and five hours. Um, so we have a camera system on board, so we'll take our pictures first and then we'll go and do some sampling um, and have a look at some of the other um, things that we're particularly interested in later on. So our dives are anything from about two to five hours uh, with these submersibles. With other bits of equipment, it can be just a few minutes that we put them in the water for. And sometimes, um, some bits of equipment, we leave them in there for days, maybe, maybe weeks. So it depends on what we're using and depends on what we want to sample. So you can see the team there in the submersible. We've got the pilot on the left side, Randy, and we've got the co-pilot who is one of our media teams, Sarah, on the right side, and she's been doing some filming down there. Fantastic. I mean, what, what, what an amazing experience to go, just, just go and do, do, do some media. And, and then how, how does that um, submersible come out of the water? Or, or do, you, do, you, do you keep it on the boat um, during the night? Yes, so you'll see somebody with a green hat up on the top and he's our swimmer and he's getting all of the lifting strops ready so that we can put it onto the crane and then it comes on board at night. There's quite a lot of work that needs to be done on the submersible when it gets back on board to make it ready for diving again the next day. So the pilot and the rest of the submersible team will be working really hard to make sure that it's ready again for tomorrow. Fantastic. So a huge amount of work all, all, all through the day. Um, this is a question coming through from Dillington uh, again. I mean, all the work that goes into the submersibles, going down in them, and you've been down uh, several times now. Uh, you're obviously quite deep. Are you ever afraid that something will go wrong? Well, I think when you're in the ocean, you have to have a healthy respect, so you can't just pretend nothing could happen. But the pilots we've got are very well trained. They've got you know, multiple years of experience. And before you go down into the depths, then they give you a briefing about how you would come up to the surface in an emergency. Um, and the submersibles will do that by just only a few actions by the crane pilots. Um, and that's explained very carefully to those of us who aren't trained pilots to make sure we can do it. Um, we've also got communications with the surface um, and they're very calm and clear. So if there was a problem, you could just talk to the surface and everything would be okay because they would tell you what to do. So I think maybe when you first go in, a few people maybe are a little bit nervous, but then once you get in there and see all the wonderful life and know you're in really safe hands of great professionals, then everything's just okay. Amazing. And you may, has, 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 this is a, the STEM club at Canuck Woods, uh, is wondering, has, has anything gone wrong on the expedition with the submersibles? <laughs> Yeah, well, you guys might have seen that in the news. There was um, a bit of a, 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 a issue the other day. We just had a little bit of smoke in one of the submersibles. Um, absolutely fine. It died the next day. In fact, it was this one right behind us. Um, yeah, there was a little bit of a problem. Everybody came to the surface. No problems at all. But that's actually 
really good for the team because all the emergency actions were swung into place and it went perfectly. So actually, I guess we can think that's a positive thing because we managed to get everybody out, no problems, back in again straight away. And everybody knows that the processes for making sure we're safe are all there and they're perfectly drilled. Yeah, processes that you, you, you never want to have to test, but you've tested them and, and they've worked really well, which is, is, is great news. Um, exactly, yes. I'm just going to move you guys around a little bit so you can see the submersible on the crane, so you can see how it comes back on board. I mean, it looks like so you can a, see I mean, now it's attached to the crane. I mean, fantastic. And, and I mean, that, that must be a very skilled... So, um, process to get, I mean, I mean, it's about four tons, the submersible, and to get that back safely on a, on a crane on a ship in the, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It is, so it takes um, a bit of a ballet of different people. Um, so we have some people online so that are keeping um, the submersible tight, and you'll hear them communicating now on the radios. Yep. You'll have the crane driver who's right up here where I'm pointing and they're lifting the submersible out of the water. Then you'll have people on deck ready to steady it, making sure it comes down into the right spot nice and safely. So it takes a really big team effort, lots of communication, watching out for each other, and um, just checking um, the position of the submersible all the time to make sure that we can do it safely. Not something you want to drop? No, no, the team are good at that. They're not going to drop it. Um, and and, and it's just going back to s some questions, this is again from uh, Mr. Barron's STEM club in, in Cannock Woods. Uh, it's, it's thinking also about the preparation that you go through. They're, they're interested in the, s in the potential stress, um, in the potential danger of going deep into the ocean. I is there any sort of mental and physical preparation that, that the team does um, before something as, you know, as serious and, uh, and, uh, and as packed as this mission? You know, that's a really good point, and it is important to prepare yourself. So some people might be a little bit nervous, others super excited, but both of those things kind of get our heart rates going and get us feeling a bit hot. So what do we do beforehand? Well, the process is very simple. We first want to get weighed. This is to make sure that they've got the right ballast in the submersible. Um, and then the next thing we do is go in from a long drink of water, get somewhere cool, and just be really calm. Um, breathing in this mess is just like breathing out here in the air, so no issues. But of course, with the bright sunlight coming in, especially in the middle of the day here, and we are right on the equator in the Seychelles, it can be really hot. So of course, all of those things can increase stress. We start off by being really um, we get into the submersible. Again, some people feel like it's quite small because you are sitting in a bubble. But of course, once you go under the water, it's like that bubble is not even there and you're in this amazing wide ocean. So all of those nerves and the feeling of being in a small area then decreases as you go down. I mean, it, it sounds like a, uh, an immensely peaceful experience as well. It is. So, um, yeah, it's amazing to just be there, be floating in the water. Um, maybe not quite so peaceful as you might think, because we need to make sure there's communications in the surface. Yes. So we always have the radio. Um, but you also have this little chirp, chirp, chirp going on. And I think that's a pretty strange noise to hear when we're down there. There's not any birds. It does sound like kind of a bird behind your ear. But in fact, it's the way the, the ship knows where the submersible is. And okay. it's this um, sonar device that allows the ship to be able to ping where the submersible is. So that pinging, that little chirping we can hear, is really important for safety. And that's actually quite nice if you know what it is. It's like, you guys know where we are up on the surface, and they'll all be making sure we're safe. So that's great. Lucy, we've, we've got a couple of questions here coming to, coming to the end of our conversation, um, but they're, they're about uh, ocean health. Um, and this this from Ms. Grenley's uh, class in Chorley, um, asking what impact um, from plastics that you may have observed on this expedition. 
yeah, so we have definitely seen some plastics, um, but actually no impacts because it's really hard to show impacts or plastics unless you do quite a lot of studies. Um, sometimes we can see um, organisms that are entangled in nets, so that would be an impact. But just because it's around doesn't mean to say that it's doing lots of bad things for the animals and the fish here. Um, so that's actually really important and that's some of the things that we're going to be studying with some of our samples is really understanding what those risks are. However, we have seen things like coral bleaching and coral bleaching obviously is part of you know, some of the impacts of climate change and we can see that happening in the waters here. Even in this beautiful pristine environment, some of those global challenges are being felt right here in this protected region. And, and you, you talk about um, coral bleaching. Is there anything that um, students who maybe don't live next to the reef can do about something like that? Yeah, so I think for everything um, in the ocean, we could think if we live in the middle of a city and we're hours and hours away from the beach, we might think we can't do anything. But actually, everybody could do something for the oceans because the oceans do things for everybody on the planet. Um, every second breath we take comes from the little um, algae that live on the surface of our water. So for us, just going about our everyday lives, it's really thinking about what we do. Can we maybe walk somewhere and take the bus rather than get in the car and have a drive? Um, do we need to use that um, throwaway um, plastic water bottle or a bit of a sandwich in a, in a bit of plastic? Or can we just take our own box? You know, there's super collared ones that we can use multiple times. So I think for me, it's just thinking about what we do and how we do it. You know, our good old pencils, we can use those. We don't necessarily need to have a new pen every day or every I mean, th that's really important. I mean, there's a, there's a rather, I don't want to sort of face it, face list it, but sort of like a pessimistic maybe um, question coming through. Um, again from Ms. Uh, Granley's class and it, is it too late or when will it be too late to change the fate of the oceans? Well and that is a really sobering question and really important for us to think about. So I don't think it's too late. We've seen amazing success when an area is protected and when, um, uh, when we can make changes um, as human beings on this planet so it's definitely not too late the ocean's really vast it's done a really good job of soaking up all those things that humans have thrown and put into it into it and into the atmosphere but we do need to start that action now we don't know how long we've got it you know in this state but we know that it's changing in some places so all of those little things we can do every day each of us is really important and it's equally as important as the work we're doing here to understand about the oceans. So being excited about the oceans, being curious about them, and just thinking about how we live our everyday lives are equally as important for all of us to be doing. Amazing, thank you. Lucy, just one final question, if, if, if we may. Um, what one thing do you think um, that everybody should know about the ocean? Well, I think should know that it is the ocean. The ocean is connected, all of it. If you're going on a holiday and you're hanging out at the beach, that same water eventually will get up to the Arctic. It'll come down to the Antarctic. There's one big thing that goes around our planet. So this is a great opportunity for us to come together as a whole human populace in whatever countries we live in or reside in right now and say we're going to do something for our ocean it's all of our own. Amazing. Lucy, thank you so, so much um, for sparing the time out of, out of what I know is an incredibly busy day. Best of luck uh, with the rest of the expedition and it's been really, really great to chat to you and thank you so much uh, for answering all those questions from the great schools um, coming in. We've had STEM clubs, we've had classes, we've had um, UK, USA and Bermuda all involved today. So thank you to you as well for your questions. Uh, for now, Lucy, it's going to be goodbye from us on Submarine Live. Thank you again. Um, 
Thank you also for watching. Uh, Submarine Live, we have in about 15 minutes a live investigation looking at why submarines are shaped the way they are. Do come back tomorrow. We've got more submarine Q&As. Uh, we have more live investigations looking at submarine engineering. Uh, a big thank you to the Necton First Ascent Mission Team, to AXA, XL, Oceans Education, and to Sonodyne. And if you've been enjoying Submarine Live, please do tune in to Arctic Live. We'll be up in the Arctic with a research team there broadcasting live from the 1st to the 8th of May. And you can sign up for free at encounteredu.com forward slash live. But until we join you again in about 15 minutes, it's goodbye from Submarine Live. Bye-bye.